All right, jaysanalysis.com. This is Jay Dyer coming to you from the road. It's been a long time since there was a road podcast. I've done quite a few of those in the past. So if you hear a little bit of background noise, it's me driving. But long drives are good for reflection, for philosophical ruminations, speculations, reminiscing. I find that listening to techno and trance on long drives provides a good uh, medium for deep thought. In this discussion, um, coming back from St. Louis, I was invited up to St. Louis by a group of guys that were longtime readers of Jay's analysis. And uh, these are Catholic guys, so we had some interesting discussions since I'm for many years no longer a part of the Roman Catholic faith. So I thought a discussion of the topics that were covered this weekend in pretty much a, an entire weekend of theological and philosophical debate and uh, sword sharpening, I guess, where we covered every possible angle, I think, of... Uh, of the theology that differs between Eastern thought and Western thought. So what I guess I'd like to do in this discussion, always impromptu, is really just give a lecture or tie it into my own assessment of what resulted from the Second Vatican Council, what led up to it, the build-up to it, the theological preparations for it and how in my view Vatican II really is the culmination of a long series of theological views in the West and how this long trek that the West went on uh, really reached its apex in 1962 to 1965 in the Second Vatican Council and its 16 documents. So rather than falling back on endless historical debates about uh, what this patriarch did or what that pope did, all that's important and can be done, but the crisis in the Roman Church, the opening of the doors of the Church, so-called, to the world, the the turn of the church uh, can really be seen in the council and in the last several decades since the council as a result of that turn. So what I want to do is talk about that, get in the history of that, and then talk about all the different responses that Catholic uh, trads, as they're called, traditional Catholics, of all the different flavors the responses that they usually give, uh, everybody sort of has their own pet theory or view of how Vatican II somehow meshes and works with all the, the previous praxis of the Roman Church, and uh, give a different perspective, give uh, an Eastern perspective that I believe avoids a lot of the dialectics, a lot of the theological errors, a lot of the assumptions that the West has had for a long, long time, and I think it provides a significant corrective to all of that. So hopefully this won't be too boring and dry, uh, but if you want to understand why there are clown masses, <laughs> uh, I myself have seen a, a hip-hop R&B mass many years ago last Novus Ordo service that I attended uh, was probably 2008, I think, somewhere in there, 2009, uh, and there was a, a bunch of college girls in flip-flops that were the servers for this service, um, and a very, very effeminate so-called priest, so for me that was the landmark point where I was done. 
was not interested in, in sending any more uh, Latin services, and that would include uh, the Latin Mass. So, you know, I, for many years in my 20s, I was very much involved in uh, the Society of St. Pius X's services uh, and keeping the true flame of traditionalism. Uh, but for many people in that worldview, in that box, <clears throat> it's something that locks them into um, uh, a very rigid, a very uh, harsh, and I think psychologically damaging perspective on the world, on history, on their own life. It's damaging to their own psyche. And I think that many people... <clears throat> find themselves trapped and they don't really know how, are there any answers to this how do we get out of this how do how can the the roman church how can the promise to peter of the you know keys in this perpetual succession and promise of never faltering roman faith etc you know is this is this the end of all that is that is the only answer agnosticism or skepticism or how could this be wrong? Well, I think the strongest case at this point is that Vatican II is the proof that the Roman Church is not the one true soul church. If it were, then quite simply it would teach the same thing that it taught a thousand years ago. The Roman Church <clears throat> does not teach the same thing that it taught a thousand years ago. There are myriad, multitude, million versions of explanations of how this is explained and how it's consistent. All sorts of casuistry from the minds of canon lawyers, from the minds of so-called philosophers in the Catholic Church, Jesuits. There's all manner of mental gymnastics that go into reconciling how this 1962 years of tradition somehow meshes with the institution of something completely different. And for those that don't believe that it's completely different, all you have to do is look at the declining numbers of churches, especially in the U.S., in the West, in Europe, the declining number of priests, religious orders, etc., etc. Now, there's all sorts of apologetic responses to all that. <clears throat> and I'm sure that in the comments here, I'm going to get quite a bit of that from uh, Catholic readers. So, uh, to Catholic listeners and readers, I want you to understand, this is not a, a mean thing. I'm not being a butthole when I come come after you guys on this, but simply to say that if truth is truth and if we believe that there is such a thing as truth then it's objective and truth can you can we can come to greater understanding of truth over time but something that's true a true proposition law of non-contradiction etc 2 plus 2 equals 4 these things don't change over time and so when we come to notions about truth evolving or progressing over time such as Cardinal Newman would give in works like Pro Apologia and Vita Sua and so forth um, the, the ideas of Newman about the development of doctrine are something foreign to the East so ironically though it's quite common in the West to say that the East is oh they're so mystical and uh, they don't uh, care about all this intellectual stuff and they're not philosophical and they don't they don't uh, understand objective truth actually the east <laughs> is uh, more grounded and solid in their starting point their presupposition their assumptions about truth and the notion that truth doesn't change they're more grounded than the west and the development of the theology leading up to Vatican II and coming out of Vatican II demonstrates that. So even this weekend, all the Catholic guys I got to meet and uh, have some really intense debates with, 
the responses tended to, you know, emphasize this notion of uh, of some sort of progress in terms of understanding, meaning that in some way doctrine changes. Now, I don't think anybody would deny that the way that people live out their their beliefs, their faith under different, say, political systems within history, say, believers in living in Byzantium are going to differ than uh, persons living their life in, uh, say, orthodoxy in America, uh, given that America is a so-called democratic republic of some sorts, at least confessionally, then you know, obviously in these cases they're going to be lived out in different ways but the confession, the belief system is not going to change in other words, the reason that the seven ecumenical councils are emphasized in discussions with Roman Catholics that's the first seven councils is not because for the East these are the only ones that matter and you know, God, God doesn't speak you know, for a thousand years, he hasn't spoken since 787 of the Seventh Council. That's not the belief. Rather, it's a point of contact with the West. It's a point of commonality. These are the periods where we have a similar structure and a similar belief. So that's our starting point. And if we look at the first thousand years, we can see the commonality there between East and West is where we can have dialogue, where we can have a, a point of common discourse. So that commonality is where we can look to discover the point of departure and, and get a good grasp of the East perspective of how that point of departure, especially around 800, uh, you know, even prior to 1054 with the official schism, but the point of departure in terms of ideology building up to it. So I'm going to give what I believe is a very coherent and hardcore critique of the strangeness and the weirdness of elements in Roman Catholicism. Now for a lot of people with perhaps uh, exotic tendencies, exotic preferences, dressing little baby dolls up in uh, different color vestments and uh, reverencing these baby Jesuses, these baby dolls, and uh, reading all these different saints, so-called like Faustina, who, you know, talks to Jesus like Jesus is her boyfriend, and Jesus talks back with, uh, in a very sensuous BFF boyfriend terminology and tells Faustina that she's the greatest nun and all of her order blah 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 I, I don't know about you but I've spent a good bit of time around women many of them re religious women and <laughs> religious women have a tendency to to this sort of excess to this sensuous um, uh, emotional uh, perspective on things. Uh, I don't mean to be you know, crass or, or dead in my view of emotions, but these are not the ways that we come to know God or speak about God. I mean, sh should we have emotions about God, about the divine? Of course. But what you see in persons like Faustina is... I mean, she's a silly woman, and that's the extent of it. And so when you look at the East and the entirety of the East, even in their monastic perspective, you might have devotional hymns, literature and so forth, that are part of the liturgy, but you have none of that kind of stuff. So why is it that there's a common praxis in terms of living out liturgy and living out things for the first thousand years and that same commonality is what exists in the East today. No change at all. 
And yet in the West, you have this divergence into all these different practices of this devotion and that devotion and this special thing with Mary as opposed to that special thing. All these different orders and these charisms and graces and all this weirdness. And all it is, for the most part, is a lot of superstition. And I hate to offend Catholic readers with that, but that's just simply the truth. Um, the, the revelations of all these different apparitions and all these different private saints, for example, if you read Father Cullen's book from Tan on the Antichrist, he cites dozens of saints in the West and the Latin saints' views on Mary and the Antichrist and how all this stuff is going to go down. Now, when you read all these quotes, none of them match up. They, they don't, they're not consistent. So if Revelation was genuinely coming to all of these various Roman saints, you know, the last 800,000 years, presumably the Spirit would not contradict. There would not be a bunch of garbled, uh, nonsensical, contradictory claims. Now, I'm aware that Roman Catholics say that private revelation is not something that is incumbent upon all Christians. But the problems of the Roman contradictions and all these different private revelations are the very thing that the East would completely reject. And this is why you see the Pope, um, since even Paul VI, I recall, uh, and if not Paul, Paul VI, uh, I know for certain that the acceptance of the Protestant charismatic movement uh, was certain uh, under John Paul II. Now, the Protestant charismatic movement is ridiculous. It is, has nothing to do with Pentecost in the book of Acts. It's a complete emotional uh, bunch of nonsense. And quite often it's led by idiotic women who believe that they're prophetess, that they're a prophetess. And they, also, they often hold completely heretical views on God. So if you don't have a correct view, belief, of you know, what for the first thousand years the church confessed for Orthodox Christology and, and an Orthodox conception of the Trinity, it makes absolutely no sense that the Spirit of God is moving amongst a bunch of uh, anti-Trinitarian in many cases uh, and heretically unorthodox in terms of their Christology a, a bunch of sects like that so the idea that that somehow the papacy can bless and, and bring into Catholicism these charismatic sects is completely ridiculous, contradictory and nonsensical and the Catholic view of their own faith historically is that it's supposed to be coherent, it's supposed to be consistent. Yes, there are supernatural truths that transcend reason, but they're not supposed to be, there's not supposed to be a bunch of contradictions in the confessed and known dogmatic statements. And that's really what I'm going to emphasize today, is the complete contradictions that despite all the attempts to invent fanciful, philosophical, scholastic explanations for how all these things mesh together and make sense, rather than reaching for mental gymnastics and inventing new terms and ideas, uh, which the Latin scholastics were very adept at, very creative ideas, uh, quite simply, uh, we can look to simpler explanations. <laughs> human superstition, human silliness, human absurdity. Uh, these are human psychology. Uh, I don't at all mean to be some sort of rationalist here, but these are much simpler, much clearer, much more prevalent explanations for many of the manifestations of the weirdness and heresy in Roman Catholicism even in the last 500 years, but especially blooming and flowering in the Second Vatican Council. So, let's start with that. 
Simply put, the, I think the best way, if a person really wanted to research and figure out how the difference is real, the difference of teaching prior to Vatican II and post-Vatican II, is to look at the papal encyclicals that preceded Vatican II. And there are quite a few of them that really, I think, stand out as exemplars for direct, total contradictions. One of those would be Pius X's encyclical on modernism, and he completely condemns modernism in this encyclical. And, in fact, there was previously an oath against modernism that clergy were, were required to adopt. And the central thesis of Pius's encyclical about modernism uh, concerns the idea of doctrinal development and change over time. So that idea is explicitly condemned as a heresy. I should mention as well that papal encyclicals in the Roman view are considered ordinary magisterium. They may not be ex cathedra, immediate definitions of what constitutes infallible faith and practice for the entire church, but they don't have to be ex cathedra to be binding on all Catholics. Uh, they constitute part of the ordinary magisterium, which all Catholics are bound to follow with sheep-like submission and reverence and support. And you'll find that in your Catholic catechism uh, under sections concerning the magisterium. So ordinary and extraordinary magisterium are binding on all Catholics. You, as a Catholic, do not have the right and authority to decide that you do not agree with the teachings in an encyclical when especially encyclicals like uh, Pius X's uh, encyclical against modernity, modernism, when they're binding and require an oath uh, to denounce modernism as heresy. So for all of you out there that claim to be Catholic, you don't have the right or the ability to decide that, you don't believe that, uh, that somehow modernism can be now meshed with your previous views. So I'm not a Catholic, but I'm telling you as a Catholic what you're supposed to believe and what you're bound to. Now, <clears throat> the Novus Ordo Church as a whole, everything constituting the Second Vatican Council's apparatus, all of those so-called communions in communion with Rome, teach modernism almost completely. All those bishops, all those cardinals, etc., they no longer take an oath against modernism, and they teach modernist principles. And if you, you might say, well, no, many of them are good. They're good people. They don't teach them. No, they do teach modernism because they teach the Second Vatican Council, which teaches that doctrine can evolve over time. So the mere fact that you do not believe the oath against modernism and that it's not taken anymore and a completely different right well, all, all completely different rites have been introduced into the church shows that it's a completely different uh, a completely different faith so it doesn't require a whole bunch of, of mental gymnastics all it requires is the simple uh, experience of those rites themselves and those rites themselves do not match up to the matter form and intention in which in Catholic theology were required in a certain set form to be necessary. So you have you have a, a set form of the matter, form, and intention for the, the rites previously. And all of those have been altered significantly, but particularly the rite of ordination and the rite of the Mass in terms of the consecration. And so when you have missing matter, form, and intention according to the traditional rite, and you can look at, uh, I believe it's uh, Pius V, the bull exerge domine, which specifies uh, precisely what the matter, form, and intention must be in the Latin rite. When you have a change of that, that's a different rite, and it's an explicit change, particularly in the words of consecration. So this is very important for Roman Catholics in terms of you know what constitutes valid mass and all that, because they have a very uh, specified uh, legalistic view of you know how this happens under you know certain circumstances of. You know, it has to be this way. And any divergence, you know, priests formerly used to freak out if they would cough during the consecration because they might be doing it wrong. So this is the 
this is the classic view. Uh, I would agree, in fact, with Vatican II's assessment that that was superstitious and silly. Nevertheless, if you are a Catholic, that's not something that you're supposed to believe is superstitious and silly. So the complete change in all their rites and all their practice to allow communion in the hand, to allow communion to, uh, you know, people who don't even believe their faith demonstrates quite clearly to an honest and open mind that that is a completely different faith. So, in other words, the way you practice things has to match up to the belief system that you have. And when there's a divergence in both of those, quite universally in the Roman Church, uh, it's a, it's a manifestation of a different doctrine. So, if we were to look, say, at the idea that, well, the church just kind of messed up and all these, these new rites are bad, and yeah, they've been promulgated everywhere, but it'll eventually get fixed. You know, one day we'll get this good pope, one day we'll get this, you know, new King Louis or whatever who's going to come along, which is all completely ridiculous. <clears throat> the idea that somehow that can all be fixed just simply isn't feasible. Why? Well, there's a condemned proposition if you look in Denzinger. <clears throat> it's called Octorum Fide, and it's the document against the Jansenists. And the Jansenists were a quasi-Calvinist sect of uh, extremely, extremely rigorous uh, Augustinian slash Cal almost Calvinist uh, Catholics in uh, France. And they petitioned to get uh, the mass, <clears throat> the mass at that time, put into the vernacular. And they said that the rites that were given were defective. So Rome, they claimed, Rome had promulgated some defective rites by not allowing the mass for them to be in the vernacular. So the response of Rome was to say it is a condemned proposition to believe or to say that that the the church that the magisterium can give to the whole church defective rights. So in other words, you as a Catholic cannot believe that defective rights of the church have been promulgated to the church by the magisterium. But for the most traditionalists, they would adhere to the idea that, yes, the papacy has messed up in this, and they've preferred defective rights upon the entire church, at least, at least in the Latin rite. But even that, even still, you could not hold that that the Latin rite itself has, through the papacy, been promulgated defective rights, because it would mean that the church fundamentally erred in its very life-giving process in terms of, you know, giving out the sacraments, which are the the means of grace. So it's completely unfeasible, and it's a completely condemned proposition, which unfortunately uh, most traditional Catholics are not aware of this, so they will believe that they're still a traditional Catholic while holding to very Protestant ideas that the papacy can err and the magisterium can err in giving uh, the entire church defective rights. So that's just simply not true. Uh, but once this is pointed out, I think, which is my intention here in this talk, uh, I think it really forces uh, individuals to come to grips with this. And you know, you shouldn't feel bad for investigating and wanting to know what's true about these cases. I mean, everybody in that, in that communion, in that group of, of the Roman church who has any semblance of actually believing their faith, uh, I think is quite uh, concerned with what's been going on in their church, especially in the last several decades. So keeping in mind then that you have to believe the ordinary magisterium, you don't have the right or the ability to dissent from it. And that would include papal encyclicals, especially those addressed to the church as a whole. And Pius X's encyclical against modernism is precisely one of those types of encyclicals. It would constitute ordinary magisterial teaching. And, and, and for proof of this, I would say the same arguments that Catholics make, even the traditional Catholics, about uh, Paul VI, the way he talked about uh, 
you know, pro-life and contraception, they will make the argument that that's binding on all Catholics. Well, if that's binding on all Catholics, then so is the oath against modernism. So is the teachings of Pius X against modernism. So it's, it's, again, it's not that difficult to just simply keep in mind that you have to believe what was always taught. Uh, and you can't, you can't have something, you know, in 1900 be true, and then in 1965 it no longer be applicable or true. Because we're not talking about some application of something. We're talking about the very heart of the faith itself, and that's precisely what Pius X says in the encyclical against modernism. So that has to be kept in mind. That has to be the starting point of all the discussion on this matter is that, that most of the Catholics out there who think that they're traditional or think that they're conservative or whatever appellations they want to use, they're not actually really that consistent with, with their views. They don't, they haven't put the time into looking at Denzinger, reading through the entire catechism and so forth, uh, and, and reading these papal encyclicals. Now I did because I was very committed to all this. I've, I've spent most of my twenties again, you know, very zealous for all this and believing it wholeheartedly. So what I would do is buy Denzinger. I would buy the papal decrees, um, you know, expensive volumes on all this stuff. I bought uh, Catechism of Trent, the New Catechism, etc. And I read all of these. And w what you find is that, especially if you read through Denzinger, you find that it, the faith is very, very consistent, very, very uh, laid out in a very wide breadth of what you have to believe. And you, you don't have the right, there's no uh, gray area within Catholicism for you to dissent against anything that constitutes part of, again, ordinary magisterium. So it's a complete mistake for Catholics to believe that they only have to believe what's so-called ex-cathedra or you know, from a council or something. That's not true. You have to believe the ordinary magisterial teaching. And the reason for that is that the belief in their view is that the the deposit of the faith uh, cannot possibly dogmatically make a statement about every possible situation or every possible um, you know avenue of, of application or belief, right? So, because that's not possible, the church has these laid down guidelines and normative traditions, and I'm speaking of tradition here in a capital T sense. And so, for example, the time of the Reformation, you'll look in Denzinger and you'll see all kinds of condemned propositions. So, with Luther, there are a whole bunch of uh, propositions that Luther held that are explicitly condemned by the church. And you have to hold all those, right? So, Trent, for example, would just be reflecting these kinds of propositions. And so, what Trent is saying is consistent with the... Uh, condemnations of, of, of Luther and the different reformers, the condemnations of, of John Huss and Wycliffe, you'll find several of these in Denzinger, for example. So you have to hold those as a Catholic. You have to believe that those propositions are condemned. Now think about this. If, if truth was something that was constantly sort of in flux and changing, and, well, we just we have a greater understanding of what that was now, so maybe he didn't actually mean that. Well, it would mean that, number one, that the church didn't know what they were doing in condemning someone as a heretic. So that's a, just a complete contradiction in practice right there. So when the church condemns the Protestant reformers as heretical and their propositions as heretical, that means then that you, as a believer, are supposed to then know that anyone else that says these propositions is at least externally, at least materially, a heretic. Now, that does not necessarily mean that they are willfully and knowingly uh, propounding heresy. They may be, uh, you know, in good faith, believing and sincerely thinking that they're correct, but that doesn't really matter from the perspective of guarding your faith from the Catholic view, right? So you're supposed to know that when the Baptist pastor says blah, 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 that is heretical because it's a condemned proposition. When he, re when he recites the very things that Luther said, Oh, well, those are condemned propositions, right? So it's, it's not that difficult. This is a very, you know, simple 
normative Catholic perspective, at least prior to, uh, you know, the 1960s. So with that in mind, we can come to these questions and have just a very simple starting point, very simple presupposition that all the things that are laid down, say in Denzinger, up to 1962 are normative. And even if there are aspects of, or, or places in Denzinger that wouldn't necessarily be, you know, capital T tradition or, you know, big D dogma, they're still normative. And uh, anything pertaining to faith and morals that's normative cannot change. Now, you might have the application of something in a certain, you know, civic sense of, you know, the church's relationship to the state or something like that that might be, uh, you know, changing over time or something like that. But you can't have faith and morals changing, and that's really the key here. And so that's why it was necessary at the time of Vatican I for theologians like uh, Colonel Newman to come up with the idea of development of doctrine over time. So that's how they would you know, justify, say, well, yeah, the, it may be true that the papacy didn't always operate this way for the first thousand years of the church, but doctrine develops over time, and so now this is what God has instituted for, for the church, and that's because, well, there's this living magisterium, and the living magisterium is, is able to you know, mesh things with uh, the zeitgeist of the, you know, the, the spirit of the times. Well, again, so what we see here is that there's kind of a double think at work here, right? So there's this the, the bureaucratic propaganda spill of, uh, on the one hand, uh, we confess that things don't change over time, but there's this also this idea of development of doctrine over time. And the development of doctrine over time actually does mean that the papacy can function in a way and to a degree that it did not previously. And for those who would disagree with that point, I would just point them to uh, sections in uh, Benedict's work, particularly uh, Introduction to Christianity. Uh, former Pope Benedict states very clearly that for the first thousand years, the uh, papacy operated in the very way that the East conceives of it. <laughs> so the orthodox perspective of the papacy for the first thousand years Benedict admits is correct, right? So that, that's all, I mean, that, that alone, I think, is, is a startling admission. Because if that's true, well, then Vatican I is not correct. And that, in that section where, where Benedict talks about that, uh, he's actually talking about uh, Vatican I and, and the definitions and statements of, of the papacy. So the papacy becomes to power, though, as uh, a political entity as a result of the fall of Rome. So when, when Rome fell in 400, because the Byzantine emperors had already moved the capital to Constantinople in the east, that was the new seat of the empire. That's why the emperors called the councils from that point on, even, even still. So all the seven ecumenical councils that were common to the east and west were called by these, these emperors. But in the west, when Rome was sacked by the barbarians, the only remaining institution of culture and civilization was the Bishop of Rome. So it's natural then the Bishop of Rome would take on not just a religious function, but also he would increase his temporal power. So this is the, the real reason for the rise of the temporal power of the papacy. So the papal decretals that most people believe, uh, you know, grant all the, the these all this temporal power to the Pope, you know, in the first uh, 300 years of the Church, uh, those are now un unanimously considered to be forgeries, because they they contain references to things that had not even that were not even uh, appropriate for that time period. Uh, so uh, even Roman Catholic theologians, for the most part, uh, do not believe that the papal decretals were are all, are authentic documents. And if those are not authentic documents, then, then really the entire notion of the, the, the temporal rise of the papacy and the, the papal states, which would come out of this, can very obviously be seen then as a historical and cultural development as a result of the, of the fall and sack of Rome. So that's the, the last institution you know, left 
uh, as the, sort of the progenitor of culture and society for the West. In the East, it was very different. You had the, you still had the notion of the imperium, and so the you know, Justinian, you know, builds the Hagia Sophia uh, as the the center of the Church of the Empire. So for the East, Byzantium was New Rome. That is Rome, right? So they, they didn't conceive of Byzantium, Constantinople, being this oppositional force to the West. And so that's why it was very strange in the Eastern mind for the papacy to crown Charlemagne, to anoint Charlemagne as the new Holy Rome, the, the Holy Roman Emperor, the, the Emperor of, of Rome, when there was already an emperor, and the West had already accepted a Christian emperor in the East for hundreds of years, because the Eastern emperors were the ones calling these ecumenical councils, and the papacy, the West, Rome, had been accepting these councils, accepting these emperors as the Orthodox emperors. So the idea of creating a rival imperium in the West with Charlemagne in 800 was seen to be bizarre and nonsensical to the East. We already have an emperor of the, of the imperium. Why do we need a? Why do we need two heads? Uh, on, on the the temporal you know imperium, there already is a head, and it's important to look at this period because, as my friend historian James Kelly has pointed out many times, it's with the Carolingian theologians, the Carolingian theologians of Charlemagne, the court of Charlemagne, where you begin to see a a stark divergence from the normative faith of the seven councils. And this is where the a new view of images comes to take place. So the, the Caroline theologians introduce the idea of 3D images and statue, statues in the church, because for them it's all it's all imagery, right? So there's never a direct connect to the divine energy itself in this life, according to the Augustinian theology that dominated the Carolinian court because there's no direct connect uh, to the divine energies. We only experience created grace in this life, and that is a created substance that's infused according to Augustinian teaching. Then it doesn't matter what images we, we make, because all imagery is just like all other imagery. So I'm an image of, of uh, God insofar as you know I'm a son. I'm an image of God the Son. Fathers are images of God the Father. Uh, the Eucharist is, is uh, you know, while it, it in the West is believed to be a real presence, it's also an image. Uh, and so it doesn't matter whether you have a 2D icon or a 3D statue. Well, this is a, a stark change from the normative practice of what had already been confirmed at the Eastern Council and in the Eastern Canons that were, that were normative for the church as a whole, because they're ratified by ecumenical councils. So the ecumenical councils that already ratified the notion of the icon as a 2D image, uh, and it is a depiction of, of the logos, right, and not the Father. So technically speaking, there's not supposed to be images of, the, of God the Father. Uh, but this is where you start to see the rise of uh, pictorial imagery of God the Father in the West. So this is again. These are these are developments in practice that that are significant in terms of a divergence in the theology. But these are, I guess, in a way, minor when it comes to the real divergence, which concerned the filioque. So the filioque was inserted uh, by the you know Carolinian court at this time uh, as a in their mind a way to battle Arianism because from the Council of Toledo, the Arian notions of uh, the son being subordinate to the father needed to be combated. So they thought the best way to combat that would be through using Augustine's speculations about the Trinity and the idea of relations of persons and that you, if, if the father and the son are equal, then that's how we know the spirit uh, is divine is because he proceeds from the father and the son. So to proceed from the father and the son, and so this argument goes, would require that the Father and the Son be co-equal in divinity. 
And so this is where we get the development of the Augustinian shield that would come to dominate the theology of Western Trinitarianism. And all of that is not the view of the East. And so because these things are all new, and they're, they're a new, adding the filioque to the creed is something new, uh, the, the East saw that as uh, a divergence, and I think correctly. And in fact, the papacy had already confirmed, as well as the ecumenical councils, that you could not add or touch the creed. So the creed was supposed to be as it was, and if you had Rome already affirming that as you know, not being altered, adding in the filioque was something that the East saw as very problematic. So that is really, I think, the, um, the starting point of the, of the theological divergence. And it does arise in a historical context as well. And so that will, ha that will play out for the next thousand years, you know, in all these different ways, especially in terms of, you know, how culture and civilization is erected, how, um, you know, people live their daily lives and so forth. We all are an outflowing of this, this very different view. And so this different view of the Trinity will also affect the church. This is why you'll have the rise of the papacy and the idea that, you know, that you have like this super bishop, right? So rather than all the bishops having the fullness of Christ, you, you, all, you need this other super bishop to, to really, really make sure. And, uh, you know, as, you know, emperor of the universe, the papacy has, you know, all full plenitude of uh, spiritual and temporal power, none of which makes any sense with, uh, you know, the way that the church is constituted in the first 300 years. And that's why they had to have the papal decretal to try to back this up, which was used for centuries in the West to bolster the idea that Peter himself, uh, you know, had all this temporal power, which he, he did not. It was completely, completely not true, completely, completely forged documents. And the, this is very prevalent in the West itself. There are many, there's a long, long history of forged documents to uh, bolster all this, this kind of ideology. And again, you know, I'm sure many Catholics out there will take issue with that. I don't really care because the majority of your own magisterium, the, your church itself now, no longer believes those things. So the, uh, the present Roman papacy does not accept the papal decretals as, as legitimate. It's a completely uh, rejected scholarly uh, view. Um, so, you know... If you have issue with that, take it up with your own uh, magisterium. I don't really care personally, so, but I think it's Ill, it's illustrative of how these things work in practice. So, that is sort of setting the stage for where we're going to move up through history, and we'll get up into um, the Reformation and then the, into uh, the Second Vatican Council and how all that plays out. So, as we get into the Middle Ages, you have with Photius the Patriarch of Constantinople in the East, <clears throat> the real uh, definitive point for the so-called schism between the East and the West, and Phocius wrote a treatise called Mystagogy, and the Mystagogy is about this difference between the Augustinian conception of Trinitarianism and the Eastern view. Now again, the Eastern view has already been laid out in the Eastern Fathers and in the councils that were all in the East and that define particularly Christology. So Christology has a direct connection to the theology of the Trinity. So if you have a different Trinitarianism, it's going to result in a different version of Christology. So for the East, the notion that Christ has a nature and a person that are distinct. He has a human nature, but he's a divine person. And they're distinct, distinct, but they're also unified. And so they're able to be unified without there being uh, any kind of composition between... Uh, in other words, if the Father is one person, the Son is a person, and the Spirit is a person. And they're able to have a real distinction without that distinction resulting in composition. So if there's not a composition in God by the fact that there are three persons, and if... Christ is able to operate in the world as an incarnate divine second person uh, and the Father is not who's incarnate and the Spirit is not who's, in, who's not incarnate, incarnate then what we see from that is that for Orthodox classic theology there's an ability 
there's an understanding that even in terms of divinity, you can have distinction, and it's a real distinction, a real metaphysical distinction, without there being division, or without there being composition. So the Trinitarian theology of the West is dominated, and it's ratified in its in its dogma, especially at Trent and Vatican I, uh, with the acceptance of what's called absolute divine simplicity. So absolute divine simplicity is an outworking of the older Greek philosophical idea that is adopted from Aristotle and Plato, that all distinctions in God are synonymous with the divine essence. So I've covered this in another talk that, that explains the difference between uh, Eastern and Western theology. But we need to mention it here in relation to Vatican II and what would come out of that because it's the theology that's in the background that would, that would lay the groundwork for how this would come about. So when you have a different theology of the Trinity and a different theology of the Incarnation, what happens is the, it may not be one generation, it may take hundreds of years, but the, these, uh, what we believe are erroneous views, result in centuries-long uh, sort of degeneration of the theology into all sorts of uh, bizarre things that, like I said, don't make sense to the East. Because the East has one singular tradition that's not ever uh, expanded upon. It's not uh, there aren't uh, new devotions that, that arise that uh, sort of take the place of everything else. There's one consistent view of of what's called theosis or deification, and that is what salvation is. Uh, and this is largely ignored in the West, which I think is a good sign that you know for the first thousand years. All the councils are unified in affirming the importance of understanding redemption and salvation in terms of, of theosis or deification. And in the West, this is rarely talked about. It's mentioned once or twice in the Catechism. It's mentioned a few times in Augustine and Aquinas. But it becomes uh, essentially a, a foreign notion. It's an exotic Eastern notion that's not talked about. But it's central in the Eastern view because in the Incarnation, the belief is that Christ took on uh, fallen human nature that was subject to death. And in that Incarnation, he deified it. And that deification of human nature that was fallen comes to full fruition in the Resurrection. So in terms of, again, the Trinity and Photius in this medieval period, Photius points out that Augustine's idea of explaining who the persons are by relations, relations of persons, is not an adequate doctrine of the Trinity. And in fact, it leads to modalism. And it leads to modalism because the way that Augustine explains and, pr and attempts to prove the procession of the Holy Spirit is through the fact that he comes from the other two. And so if he comes from the relationship of the Father and the Son, if he's the love of the Father and the Son, what you have is an attribute of God that takes on a hypostatic quality. So love is not glue, it's not the glue between the Father and the Son, it's not uh, a person. Uh, all of the persons share the attribute of love, right? So you can't make an attribute into a person. So God's wisdom is not another person. You know, God's love is not another person. God the Father is who God is. That's the one true God. And God the Father is, he uh, generates the Son. That's a specific Greek term. That's a hypostatic property of the Son. So you can only use generation of the Son. And that's his particular personal quality or hypostatic property that defines who he is as the Son, as the Logos. The spirit proceeds, and there's that specific Greek term identifies his relation to the Father. Because the Father is the arche, the the source of, of deity of divinity, the Godhead. And he generates the Son and he spirates the Spirit. So that's the classic Trinitarian model. And with Augustinianism and with the adoption of uh, the relations of persons in the West, the doctrine becomes one where the hypostatic 
properties are interchangeable. And they're interchangeable because the love between the Father and the Son is just a term for the Spirit. So in other words, you can start interchanging persons with attributes. Persons are not attributes. The Spirit is not the love that exists between the Father and the Son. And I, uh, Augustine got this idea from Plotinus. He, doesn't, he didn't get this from Scripture or any of the Eastern Fathers or Councils. It's an idea that comes out of uh, Plotinus. Plotinus says that between the, the monad and the dyad, the, the love between them is, the, uh, is what produces the triad. So this is a, a, an idea directly out of Plotinus. I believe it's the fifth Aeneid. And Augustine just sort of, you know, cut and paste this into his Trinitarian, into his triadology. So with that in the background, we can begin to see how <clears throat> the Western view would make a gradual millennial shift towards modalism. And that what modalism is, is the idea is that God is basically just one. There's, there's one deity, and that one deity is absolutely simple, and everything that exists in the world is sort of a, refl a reflection or an emanation from that one. Right, so this is basic Platonism, or Neoplatonism as well. So emanationism is the result of this theology, and you have, uh, you know, for example, with Origen, uh, when Origen was arguing for his uh, Platonic version of, of theology, he believed in absolute divine simplicity, and so his view of simplicity said that the Father is the exact same as the divine essence. If the Father is the exact same as the divine essence, then that requires that any attribute of God be synonymous with the divine essence. So, to be everlasting, to be creator, well, then he's everlasting creator, right? So, if the divine essence is what it is, and it's eternal, then God is an eternal creator. And to be an eternal father, he has to be, to have a creation over which he's father, right? This also relates to generation. If the generation of the Son is eternal, and it's an eternal action of God, then creation is also an eternal action of divine essence. And so the generation of the Son is no different than the generating, generating of the created order. It's another eternal emanation or, or movement out of God. Right? So and the reason for that again is that the, the founding position or presupposition is absolute divine simplicity explicitly stating that anything that you say about God is, is exactly the same as the divine essence and Aquinas says this in many places in the Summa I have numerous articles pointing this out and the idea again goes back to Augustine now a lot of Catholics will say well that isn't really you know that's, that's their speculation that's not dogma no it is dogma uh, the Council of Sins, which uh, Denzinger mentions, explicitly states, uh, ratified by uh, papal acceptance, explicitly states that every attribute of God is synonymous with the divine essence. There, there's not a real distinction between God's love and God's foreknowledge, between God's justice and God's mercy. They're all exactly the same, and they are the divine essence. This is explicitly stated in the Catechism as well, and it's said so many times in Catholic theology that for any Catholic to say that that's not dogma is just not really being intellectually honest, I don't think. So, you know, if you look under, uh, to grab Denzinger and look in the back under Divine Simplicity, and you're going to see numerous references to the very thing I'm talking about. Uh, the Vatican I definition of Divine Simplicity also says this. So, again, what this means is that uh, act is essence, uh, as Aquinas says, so any action of God is, is the Divine Essence quite literally and quite consistently. Uh, this is reaffirmed as well uh, in later Catholic theology and in Denzinger. So uh, it's just a mythology to say that this is, this is speculation and you don't have to you know, dogmatically hold to this. You do have to. Trent also, uh, uh, doc, excuse me, the Catechism of Trent uh, speaks of the divine simplicity in this way as well. Uh, and if we look at the documents of Trent <clears throat> in the section on justification, uh, there's a mention of created infused justice. So created infused justice, created love, created grace are explicitly used in the dogmatic statements 
to describe an infused substance that God creates. Okay, so they're not talking about uh, the sacramental uh, uh, matter. They're not talking about the the host and the, or the bread, wine. They're they're talking about the grace itself as created. Okay, so it's not about the host. <clears throat> it's not about baptismal waters. It's about the infused uh, infused substance of grace that comes into the soul. That is a heretical idea. Grace, grace is not in its substance or essence created in the East. Grace is a participation in the uncreated energies of God, the uncreated deifying power of God. And that's why Augustine says that in the Old Testament, the Logos is not those angelic manifestations in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, they're not the Logos, they're just creaturely manifestations. Why does he say that? Because his view of divine simplicity uh, does not allow for a real visible manifestation of the divine in the created realm. Aquinas believes this as well. Uh, that's why everything in uh, Thomistic theology is based around the analogy of being. You, you can only have creaturely analogs of the divine. You can never have a real uh, visible manifestation of the divine into this realm, into the, the material plane. And that's because God is absolutely to absolute divine simplicity. Uh, now, he did, uh, you know, Aquinas would say that, that God became incarnate. Uh, but <clears throat> Aquinas believes that the grace that graced the human nature of Christ in the incarnation was created grace. So, you know, all these attempts at trying to, you know, solve this and answer this and, you know, Franciscans like Bonaventure uh, do try to, to soften the blow a little bit here. Uh, but it doesn't really matter because, again, created, <clears throat> infused created grace is mentioned by the Council of Trent. So, uh, <clears throat> so that doesn't really soften the blow to, to cite somebody like Bonaventure prior to the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent trumps Bonaventure's speculations in Roman Catholic theology and praxis. So that's all setting the stage then for how the West would then go down a certain course in its belief about God. If God is absolutely simple and every attribute or predication in relation to him is identified with the divine essence, that, that means the divine will is equated to the divine essence as well. So there's not a distinction between nature and person in God. There's not a distinction, distinction between person, nature, and will in God. And so therefore, any action of God is the same as the divine essence quite literally and quite simply and quite totally. Again, ex numerous times this is stated in Catholic uh, dogmatic theology, so it shouldn't be debatable. So if one has that view, then the result is that we don't have any direct perception of God in this life. We have creaturely uh, analogs and, and supposed uh, you know, bridges to, to experience God, but it's always still created. And again, this is explicit in Aquinas, in this life. Now, when Barlaam the Augustinian went and debated Gregory Palamas on this very topic, Palamas pointed out that, well, if you don't ever have a direct uh, metaphysical union and experience with God in this life, apart from, the, you know, the veil of creatures, then all you ever know is creatures, right? So all you're ever learning is creaturely analogs you're never directly experiencing God. And Barlaam says, correct, not until the afterlife. Well, in the East, that would be viewed as heretical because why, there, you wouldn't even need an incarnation. The incarnation isn't necessary. If all we needed was creaturely analogs, God could just point us to you know, the, the, correct, uh, the correct ideas, the correct propositions, the correct symbols, the correct images, whatever. Uh, rather, the East says man's, man's problem was deeply moral and metaphysical, and so his entire being needed to be reformed, and that happens in this life. It begins in this life. So the beatific vision is not this staring at the divine essence in the afterlife. The, the vision of God is now, and that was the whole meaning of the transfiguration. Right? So the West tends to say that the, the light that the apostles see coming out of Christ, that's a created creaturely analog, a creaturely image of God's divinity. The East says no, that's the uncreated divine energies of God. And the implications of that are 
that that's what we participate in and experience in this life. Uh, in the uh, Western view, that's not the case. That's why they have the doctrine of the beatific vision, which the East does not have. So the experience of God in the afterlife is not an intellectual vision of the divine essence. It's a resurrected body that experiences things in somewhat of a similar way that we experience them now, uh, but closer to something like Eden, right? So we will be forever learning God, as uh, Gregory of Nyssa says. Uh, so the body is, again, central in it to the Eastern view of the eschaton. Uh, however, even though the Latins would confess belief in the bodily resurrection, the idea of what the afterlife is, is, again, it's always the beatific vision. It's always this intellectual perception of the divine essence. Yes, through grace, I understand that. But, again, it makes no sense. That's, <laughs> that's not, when Jesus says that, uh, you know, we, we will see God, you know, the blessed will see God, he's talking about now. The apostles, when they look at him, they're seeing God, right? So they're, and they're seeing him directly, not through creaturely analogs, but especially in the transfiguration, they're seeing the divine light directly. Direct perception with the eyes through the noose. And the noose is the tripartite view of anthropology that the East has in distinction to Latin theology, which has a, a duality view of man's nature. Man is a body and a soul the soul is basically identified with the mind, psyche, or intellect. In the East, the mind, psyche, or intellect is actually subject to, in subordination to, the noose. And the noose is the faculty that God gave all men to know him and see him directly and immediately, experientially. So those, again, are huge differences between the East and the West. Then, uh, with all that in mind, when we look at the next several uh, hundred years in the West, it's not surprising that you would have the outbreak of the, of the Reformation. So what I was getting to with the idea of uh, uniting or equating the will with the divine essence results in the idea that ultimately God's actions are essentially predetermined. So uh, what this amounts to is saying that God is not ultimately free. Even God himself is bound by his own essence. And if you believe in absolute divine simplicity, what that then means is that all of the actions of God throughout history are completely determined. Because history, again, is just a, an emanation from his divine essence. And so, therefore, anything that God wills is merely synonymous with his divine, eternal, unchangeable essence. So all of history, all of human actions are completely predetermined. And this is where you would get, out of Calvinism and Lutheranism, hard determinism. It's a result of what's called theological voluntarism. The idea that there's not objective good out there uh, that all beings submit to on the basis of their inherent metaphysical principles. But rather that God is the source of determining with radical through the will, what is right or wrong. Okay, so you, you can have two sides of this dialectic. You can either have the side where everything is completely predetermined because it's an eternal reflection within history of the divine essence, which is sort of the hard Calvinist perspective, or excuse me, the hard, the, more of a hard Lutheran type perspective. Or you can have the, the view of, you, you could go the other side and say, well, God is radically free uh, and his will is his essence. And so, therefore, uh, morals, history, uh, op divine operations within history are, are completely uh, chaotic. They can be anything. God could at one moment will to, you know, save Mary, and then as soon as Mary enters heaven, God could will to damn Mary and send her to hell. All right? So this, this is a radical nominalist view of the divine will. The divine will is completely uh, free of any predeterminations or human conceptions about it. And again, both of these views, whichever side of this dialectic you fall down on, they're both an outworking of absolute divine simplicity. That's their starting point. It's the starting point of all theology in the West. And so it results in either-or problems where you either have a complete predetermination of events because everything is an emanation, a reflection of 
of an eternal mirror in the divine essence. Uh, or you have a completely process theology perspective where uh, God himself is in process with the natural world. When things are things are changing, chaotic. Uh, God is, you know, limited and even he, he's having to learn stuff too. He doesn't know everything. So God then loses, you know, classical attributes of omniscience and omnipresence, etc. So both of these views, uh, you know, we, we will see that pop up in the next, you know, from the Reformation on in the West. You know, you get, uh, you know, the hard determinism of Calvinism and Puritanism and Lutheranism, uh, and you get the hard, uh, or, or the, the chaotic flux process theology that we would see in people like Whitehead or Schleiermacher and people people like that. The the later liberal Protestants fall down on the other side of this dialectic. And so for Rome, it's it's interesting to see that Rome ultimately, as a result of its absolute divine simplicity and its views of, of human anthropology and God's relation to the natural world ultimately all of these religions then are just merely symbolic manifestations of the one and so Buddhism Hinduism, any other religion and you'll see this in Ratzinger's books for example when he talks about uh, uh, other religions he'll, he'll speak this way he'll say that you know Buddhism or, or Hinduism reflect ultimately uh, symbolic uh, versions of the same message of Christianity now, while it may be true that different religions contain aspects of truth and, and elements of truth, what's being said here in the process theology of the modern Roman church is, is very different. It's more, this is more in the direction of um, something like a New Age or Masonic type of view where all religions are placed on an equal footing and they all just kind of point in the same direction. So the, the mythologies of these different uh, you know, mystery schools, the Eleusinians and so forth, the mythologies of Buddhism and Hinduism, they're all just pointing to this overarching perennialism or traditionalism, uh, and any religion ultimately can serve as a means to that end. Now, there may be differing ideas amongst Catholic theologians as to how loosely that's interpreted. Uh, but what's not, what's undeniable is that this adoption, the, the, the adoption of this view, has completely led to the disintegration of Catholicism. And it's something that's completely foreign to the theology that's spoken of in uh, Pius X's encyclical on modernism. Pacendi Dominici Gracious, which is, uh, you can look that up. You'll see that you can't have this open, equal footing for all religions. Uh, Mortalium Animos is the encyclical of Pius XI uh, in, I believe, 1928. And this describes what I'm talking about. Uh, Pius XI says that you can't have in Catholic theology this notion of re reason and revelation. Uh, sort of evolving over time, this, this evolutionary process view that, well, at one time in the Middle Ages, the church understood salvation in a, in a very rigid sense, and now things have evolved, the, the world has changed, uh, we've got to you know, update to the modern times and accept the idea that salvation is really uh, an existential process that everyone is experiencing through every religion because they're all just again mirrors or images of the one and if everything is just a mirror or image of the one as Augustine or Aquinas say you know, in their ultimately platonic view then there's not really a difference between the principles of truths in Buddhism and the principles and truths in any other religion they're all the same because they're all just manifestations of the, of the one uh, so that symbology, that semiotic uh, version of theology there, again, just leads to a complete disintegration of any perspective of unique or objective truth. So that's really the, the heart of the matter. And that's why you see, you know, regardless of all the stuff that they 
say in their double speak. That's why you see post-Vatican II popes praying with and and in the in participating in the liturgical rites and relig- and, and uh, practices of other religions, including religions formerly considered idolatrous and demonic. So it can't be demonic in 1500 to participate in pagan ceremonies and in uh, 1965 it become okay right so again because morality doesn't change so it, it's really not that difficult it's pretty simple uh, that even though what we've been talking about is, is pretty advanced theology in terms of the, the outworking of this the practice of this it's quite clear that if, if you do participate and, and consider yourself you know able to participate in other religions ceremonies and rites it's pretty obvious that you don't believe that yours is you know unique and that that one is demonic now you know, again I'm not really that interested in what uh, Rome ultimately does because I think Rome fell a long time ago and that's what we'll get into here in a minute but that that capitulation theologically to process theology and to modernism and that's really what modernism is if you look at the the papal uh, condemnations of modernism is that really it's just the idea of what we might see in say Teilhard de Chardin it, it's the idea that theology is an evolution just like everything else is an evolution this by the way is why evolution is such a bad idea is because it ultimately it means that everything is in a dialectical process towards whatever and constantly changing constantly in flux and that means your ideological beliefs are constantly changing and in flux as well so Nothing is fixed. Everything is historically relative and in, in, in flux. I found it very ironic when I visited the cathedral, the basilica in St. Louis. It was a very grandiose building, very beautiful from an aesthetic perspective. But the very first mosaic on the right in the ceiling is uh, a tribute to Vatican II's definition of uh, religious liberty and freedom dignitatis, dignitatis humanae so there's a homage paid to this as if this were some pillar of you know, western theology and this of course forms the basis for a lot of ecumenism and yet in the in the, in the portico in, in the, as soon as you walk in the apse or whatever it's called in the mosaics, you have Saint Louis, the king, uh, marching off to crusades. <laughs> so, I mean, you couldn't get more uh, incoherent than these two images trying to mash together, right? Now, certainly, Catholic theology uh, tended to not say that you know conversion should be forced, although that did happen in certain instances. Certainly the tendency in, in the official theology was not to force people to convert. So, obviously I don't mean religious liberty in that sense as something, something perennial for, for the Catholic tradition. What I'm talking about is the very thing that Vatican II described in its doctrine of religious liberty, that... Uh, families and nations should be completely free to, de- to determine whatever faith they want, which means ultimately that everything is placed on an equal plane. So if you're a Catholic, Catholicism has no more right to cultural supremacy than does Satanism. There, there's no supremacy in terms of uh, culture and the state at all. And this is explicitly condemned in Pius the Eleventh encyclical on the Feast of Christ the King. So the very thing that, that Vatican II affirms as the heart and meaning of religious liberty and religious freedom of conscience and so forth is the very same thing that's condemned in Pius XI's encyclical on the Feast of Christ the King. And again, religious liberty as well has been condemned many times in the history of the Church in the very sense that Vatican II means it, right? So we're not talking about everybody misunderstands this and thinks, oh, uh, you're talking about, uh, you know, people should be forced to accept uh, 
know, Catholicism. No. I mean, the Crusades were a defense against Islam. But Louis was fighting in the Crusades for God, right? I mean, that's just common sense. Everyone knows this. Fighting to defend Christian lands and the Christian faith. And yet we have the papacy even now. Uh, the, the current jokesters that occupy the, that office, uh, all, all two of them, <laughs> the two popes, the one that resigned and the one that currently uh, heads it, both say violence should never, ever be used in the name of God. Right? So this is directly, well, it's day and night contrary to the, to the whole ideology of the Crusades, right? which was not about conquering other lands. It was about defending Christian lands, and that's, that's understandable. Well, that's, that's violence in the, in the name of God, right? In the name of theology. So I don't know how more retarded and dis- intellectually dishonest and obviously day and night you could get than having one mosaic praising Louis, St. Louis, going off to the Crusades, calling them, two of them. And uh, I know that popes called them, but Louis went took the army and at the same time uh, this declaration of religious liberty we're now what that means from looking at papal practice and Catholic practice it means that you participate in uh, praying in mosques and that's what both Ratzinger uh, and uh, uh, John Paul have done so again this is just we don't need a bunch of your Casustry or your mental gymnastics about how that makes how you can do that how how as a Catholic that somehow now makes sense you know after 1965 when for 1,965 years that was completely forbidden and the canons of the church uh, in the early councils explicitly forbid doing that very thing in fact they impose excommunication for doing that very thing so uh, again this is just total intellectual dishonesty and the the Catholic world just really doesn't know how to deal with this. They, they really can't come to grips with the outworkings of all this. Right? So they, they have to invent uh, you know, all sorts of mental salves and band-aids to try to cover over this and figure out how it makes sense that, well, when the Pope went there, he wasn't actually uh, participating in uh, the service, uh, even though he was facing towards Mecca and he was praying uh, with uh, Islamic prayers, uh, but what, what he was actually doing was uh, praying privately to himself about G- that. It's just a bunch of nonsense. You don't do that unless you don't believe your religion. I mean, you, you're just not, it, it's an obvious action of apostasy. And classic Catholic moral theology explicitly calls that an action of apostasy. Aquinas Siva says in the Summa, if, you, if a Catholic were to pray, at the tomb of Muhammad, uh, that would be apostasy. He would be an apostate. So in Catholic theology, what they're doing is complete night and day. I mean, I don't know how many times this has to be stressed, how obvious this is, and I'm sorry that you need all the mental gymnastics, and I understand. I mean, when I was Catholic, I had to go through all the rigors of trying to figure out how to make sense of that, but it doesn't make sense, and that's that's the point. So being intellectually honest, I think, is the first step in saying look, this is night and day, and it couldn't be more obvious that it's night and day. I mean, the very Pope, so-called Pope Jesuit guy who's occupying the office now, (laughs) officiated a clown mass, okay, so he's got Pinocchio and different Disney characters dancing around in his clown mass, and you can find this on YouTube. Obviously, that guy doesn't take your religion very seriously, so the guy that you all look to as your, you know, great leader... He doesn't even believe the very things that you guys believe. Uh, And to me, you know, it's not a matter of some stupid argument about whether popes can sin. I understand all the Catholic theology that that you believe that the papacy can engage in sins and not lose the office. I understand all that. But there's a big difference in that between that and the Catholic doctrine of heresy, schism, and apostasy. You can't apostatize and remain a Catholic. (laughs) <laughs> that's, that's obvious, okay? So read uh, Pope Leo's encyclical on the papacy uh, or read uh, Pius XI's encyclical 
uh, excuse me, Pius XII encyclical, uh, Mystici Corporis, where he talks about the body and what the meaning of the mystical body is. And he explicitly says that the heresies of sin, schism, and apostasy uh, immediately, de facto, uh, ipso facto, excommunicate you from the body of Christ. That's why in Catholic canon law, uh, it was, I don't know if it still is, because I haven't been involved in Catholicism, but uh, for quite a while it was normative that you uh, were you were ips, you were automatically excommunicated if you procured a, 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 an abortion uh, knowingly, right? So that's just one example of an action that ipso facto excommunicates you from the church. Uh, well, it's not it's not the only one. So there are others, and the other sins that automatically excommunicate you include heresy, schism, and apostasy. So any of those make one not a Catholic. And the reason that both Leo and Pius XII give for that is that heresy, sin, and schism are sins such that they are so grave as to immediately remove one from the visible mystical body. So that's why canon law says that about ipso facto excommunications and that's why what's applicable to abortion and immediate excommunication is also applicable to the sins I just listed heresy, schism, and apostasy so of course none of that's actually really enforced uh, in the Vatican II apparatus of course every now and then some extremely bizarre group of weirdos that ordain women or whatever will get so-called excommunicated. But that's really just publicity because it's completely inconsistent. They don't excommunicate any of the multitudes of bishops that don't teach classic theology, classic Catholic teaching. So that's all really just public that's PR stuff. They do that to show like, to act like they're doing something quote conservative. And that's really the, the bureaucratic doublespeak that the Vatican is so good at. They're masters of, of playing both sides of these kinds of things. So again, that makes sense though with an idea of process theology because everything's in process anyway. It doesn't really matter. So you know, 20 years from now, maybe pedophilia will become uh, a good thing. Maybe it'll be a holy thing. I mean, you, again, if everything's in flux, uh, if, if theology is in process and in, in evolutionary development, uh, there's no reason why it couldn't evolve in that direction, right? But that's completely insane. That's ludicrous. Uh, but that's the problem, is that uh, you have this long, centuries-long development of the outworkings of Western views of the Trinity and divine simplicity and created grace, and uh, intellectual versions of theology from Thomism and so forth. And what this re results in, when you have these Western medieval schools like nominalism and realism and so forth, these schools are really just commentaries on an older Platonic tradition from Origen, Plotinus, Augustine. And they're trying to work out the same difficulties that Origen and Plotinus and Augustine were trying to work out. And so the outworking of all that really is, it is a, there is a track of theology throughout history, especially in the West, that we can look at and see that the rise of Enlightenment deism, the rise of Western atheism is the very thing that Gregory Palamas predicted would happen to the West. So when he's debating with Barlaam the Calabrian, he tells Barlaam, he says, you and your theology will lead to complete atheism because you don't believe that you're ever directly knowing God. So if you don't ever directly know God, uh, you're only knowing create, uh, created uh, analogs and analogies and so forth. What's going to happen is the God in this system really becomes irrelevant and unknown. All right? it's, it's always an unknown. It's never a direct experience with the uncreated energies of God. So what happens then is uh, deism comes about, the idea, well, the, maybe there's just a generic supreme being, 
which is basically the same idea behind the process theology of modern Rome, that all religions are just basically symbolic manifestations of, of one primal truth, and none of them is more true or false than the other. Uh, and you have, at the same time, uh, the, the adoption of uh, ecumenism with that. So ecumenism is really just an outworking of an, this older idea. And this, again, ecumenism is very obviously and clearly connected to big uh, families funding it, like the Rockefellers. The Rockefellers set up the ecumenical movement. The World Council of Churches is a uh, part of a you know partner group to to the uh, United Nations and so forth. Well, the League of Nations and then and then the United Nations. And this was the means by which they would coax uh, religion in the West, particularly Christianity, into diluting itself into oblivion. So there's a larger plan at work here, a larger scheme, strategy. Uh, you can read Collier and Horowitz's biography of, of the Rockefeller family, family, it's authorized biography. And uh, there are several chapters that describe the Rockefeller funding of and creation of the ecumenical movement in the World Council of Churches. And what this would do is draw in all the so-called bodies uh, and even eventually Catholicism, even though, uh, for example, Pius XI in uh, Mortalium Animos forbade participation in those things. Uh, now it's the norm. So again, how can it be wrong in 1928 to participate in these ecumenical gatherings and then now it's not wrong. Now it's good. it can be done in the right way, supposedly. But this is all just double speak. It's all just tricks. It's a scam. So I would encourage you to stop falling for the scam because the higher-ups don't even believe it themselves. They don't believe this stuff. And they're just hoodwinking you and playing a game with it. And so if we want to understand the darker side of how this came to be, with the rise of Enlightenment, Deism, and so forth, you had the acceptance of philosophical, speculative Freemasonry in the West. So many governments... Uh, you know, even by the 1600s, Masonic lodges were spreading throughout Europe, and they promoted a revolutionary idea of naturalism and, and the primi primacy of reason, rationalism, so forth, scientism. This is all Enlightenment Masonic uh, presuppositions and philosophy. And so, in this view, uh, again, the god of this view is really just the process of nature itself. Again, now we start to see the, the commonalities with modern Rome and their process theology. Right? So they're, they're not teaching anything different ultimately than um, the Masonic speculative philosophy. Now maybe you believe that. Uh, maybe you believe process theology is true. Maybe you're a Mason. Maybe you think uh, you know nature itself is, is what we mean by deity and God. Um, that's your business. But while I'm getting at here is trying to point out the obvious contradiction in the last several hundred years of Roman theology, not just. So this is why, again, we see so many of these Vatican theologians being so radical, you know, really going haywire from Hans Kuhn to Skillebeck, Beeks, Bex, whatever. And there's just a whole gaggle of them. Uh, and it's important to understand that even Benedict and people like that, so-called conservatives, uh, are really pretty revolutionary in their theology as well. I mean, their, their writings are full of higher criticism, higher textual criticism, uh, you know, full of ecumenism. Again, they're very much night and day with, you know, 1928 Mortalium Animus, uh, you know, Pius XI. So, so the, even the so-called conservatives of today are the radical liberals of, you know, the 1950s and 60s. You know, Ratzinger, you know, wore a suit and tie to, to Vatican II when he was the theological advisor. So these are not conservatives. And, uh, you know, in my opinion, they, uh, you know, are either co-opted or corrupt uh, or are blackmailed by different intelligence agencies. So there's a darker side to this that I was getting to where the adoption of different 
revolutionary Masonic philosophies uh, results in, over time, um, this long warfare between uh, Rome and, and Masonry and different secret societies and occultic orders and so forth. And so this is why we see in the 1700s, I believe it's Clement the 13th has the first encyclical against Freemasonry. And then from then on, there's a string of, I don't know, 10 or so uh, encyclicals that deal directly with the encroachment and threat of Masonic philosophy into Catholicism and even to the point of the discovery of the Alta Vendita documents of the P2 Lodge of Italian Grand Orient Masonry uh, right around the turn of the century, describing the plans to co-opt the papacy for the revolutionary faith of Masonry. So, uh, of, of Grand Orient Masonry in particular. So it's not as if, you know, this is a, a new thing at in 1965. I mean, you already have uh, Benedict the Fifteenth uh, back in the 20s, uh, if I recall, 20s or 30s, uh, participating in the League of Nations. Right? So then the League of Nations is this, you know, Western banking elite creation. So this is already setting the stage for how the church will adopt ecumenism, the World Council of Churches and all that. And what begins to pour in is multiculturalism, uh, Marxism, and the, the flowering of the Marxism that was coming in, we really see with John the 23rd. John the 23rd worked with uh, Marxist groups when he was a young priest. He was very much revolutionary. His encyclical Pacem in Terrace, is uh, very much a Marxist encyclical, uh, calls for the redistribution of wealth, and we've seen this again with the papacy. Uh, and these are not uh, from the perspective of distributism, as many Catholics like to portray it. These are part and parcel of a larger plan, a larger strategy of the complete realignment of religion in the West. Okay, so what you see in um, John the Twenty Third's encyclical about it, what, it, what it ends up supporting is actually like the IMF and things like that. You know, the, the World Bank, IMF, somehow these are going to be the, the great governing bodies that are going to save us from uh, the evil capitalists who are hoarding assets and so forth. Right? So now, granted, there are evil you know, oligarchs that hoard assets and keep people in poverty. The problem is that all that socialist, uh, Marxist gobbledygook that uh, the papacy is spilling with spitting out with uh, John the 23rd uh, just like uh, Benedict's encyclical about you know that, that mentioned that touched on this the, the solutions they propose uh, result in uh, international bodies that are behind it all right so the IMF World Bank things like this these are the very institutions that uh, are furthering uh, the transference of wealth to elite oligarchs. Uh, so, it, it's again, it's not real. They're not. They don't ever call out the real bodies behind these these scams. And it's it's the UN and it's UNESCO, and it's the IMF and World Bank that are the problem. And uh, they're not calling out those bodies. They're calling for international bodies to be erected to you know redistribute wealth. And they also don't call out any of the other uh, uh, you know major culprits anymore. So. You, know, you don't hear them calling out these same big banks uh, for drug laundering, or excuse me, for money laundering and, and drug trafficking, which is in the hundreds of billions a year. I've never heard a priest talk about any of that. Uh, never heard papacy talk about any of that. Now, they might give some credence here and there to talk about corruption, but what I'm getting at is that they don't go after what's really going on because they're blackmailed, I believe. All right, so all the pedophilia stuff is because different intelligence agencies, different occultic groups, different secret societies as a network have a lot of these prominent people blackmailed. And so what you'll see is at certain times you'll have a release, you know, in Italian media, in French media, of all of these scandals of different priests, bishops, etc., doing this, that, and whatever, uh, you know, different gay clubs or whatever. All right, so these releases are done strategically when certain things need to be uh, achieved, certain goals, certain ends. 
and so this has gone on for a long time, and the the ultimate conceding to the uh, Western power structure by the papacy is what we see at Vatican II. So we see a complete sort of capitulation to the CIA and uh, you know the the Royal Society and, and the British machinations of, of global strategies, which all that UN stuff comes from, all that Rockefeller planning. It's all older British Royal Society ideas. Uh, the Vatican getting behind that is actually a strategic move on the part of Western planners, Western think tanks, Western oligarchs, and Western intelligence agencies to uh, get the Vatican during the Cold War on its side to fight supposed communism. Right. So what it actually does is it actually transforms because because the CIA and these groups were not. Uh, in the big picture, ultimately wanting to end communism, all it ends up doing, uh, the, the very group that created the CIA, uh, Rockefellers, are the ones who, uh, you know, further and fund uh, multiculturalism, uh, socialism, and so forth in other countries. So what this ends up doing is just actually socializing and multiculturalizing and Marxistizing the Roman tradition as a whole. And so that's what you see. So the, 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 the clown masses and all that, all that is is just an outworking of the bad theology that gets replaced with power politics, the temporal power of the papacy and so forth, capitulating to working with intelligence agencies for geopolitical power and so forth, which ultimately, again, results in, it's not that power in itself is bad, it's that when the bad theology is there and you lose the, the, the tradition, then all that's left is temporal power in the state and this capitulation to uh, achieving you know geopolitical domination and the papacy you know for a long time has been um, I believe uh, has capitulated and has been controlled by the the ultimately the global power structure the oligarchs the anglo-american establishment and so uh, there was probably something along those lines involved in uh, Ratzinger's uh, resignation from the papacy uh, because it was at the same time as these uh, leaks were coming out, these revelations about um, gays in the Vatican, uh, more pedophilia, supposedly just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the pedophile priests, uh, all of it which was strategically planned and allowed to happen in order to bring down Western institutions. And a lot of people think, well, that's, that's the communist goal. That was, that was Russia's goal. Communism was a, an export from London to Russia to destroy Russia. So any communism coming from Russia back was just communism coming back home. <laughs> so it wasn't Russia exporting communism to the West, as uh, Fatima supposedly uh, makes the accusation. Uh, you'll notice that, curiously, Fatima does not point out that London will spread her errors to all the corners of the globe. It was London that spread communism to Russia, not the other way around. So Fatima uh, is, again, another hoodwink in this uh, giant geopolitical game where, again, as I said at the beginning of this talk, the Marian apparitions and all these you know, supposed predictions, none of them make sense. They don't add up with one another. Uh, and so you have, because of the loss of this this classic tradition that the East, I believe, does preserve, you have that loss in the West, people are floundering about look, looking for mystical experiences and direct experiences. And traditional Eastern theology uh, actually discourages those kinds of mystical experiences. Not all mystical experiences, but the idea of, like I said before, talking to Jesus like he's my boyfriend. That's retarded. It's ridiculous. And that's not a feature of Eastern theology. It's also very, uh, you know, demeaning to, to the divine. Yes, God uh, can become incarnate. God can communicate to us through, through matter, through created means. But it's it, all of this, this, you know, again, this Faustina type stuff, all of this is all a manifestation of, of ultimately root causes that are theological and philosophical in nature. And that's why the East, for all of its problems, does not have these problems. <laughs>
Uh, that's, that's not to say there aren't problems. Again, there, there are plenty of problems anywhere. But I think the, again, what, what we have with Vatican II is essentially the public confirmation that the House of Cards has fallen. And it didn't, it didn't fall in 1965. It fell a long time prior to that. And you just have people propping up and believing in and wanting to believe in that tradition when, unfortunately, uh, it's just ultimately become now bankrupt. Right? So, again, I don't mean to say that there's, you know, there aren't interesting uh, Catholic uh, theologians, there aren't interesting philosophers and, and artwork. And, you know, I'm not saying that it's all completely... Um, you know, the, the last history of a thousand years of the West is not a, a complete waste of time. Uh, I'm saying that in terms of whether it's true or not, Vatican II really comes to the fore as the apex of, of the rot of the West. And it really is a rot because uh, all the ecumenism, all the craziness, of the, you know, the influx of the New Age, uh, again, just despite uh, the many sincere Catholics who you would like to you know, root all that out well, the problem is that your own Petrine guide uh, is the one who fosters it all and you know you're faced with a dilemma at that point you know either this is the true religion or it's not uh, and if it's not then other options need to be considered on the table and if other options are on the table that make more sense of it, then to me that seems more coherent and more logical because you know, we, we can't, we can never toss out logic. We can never toss out objective truth. So that concludes this discussion of the influx of Masonic groups on capturing the papacy, the destruction of uh, Vatican II and so forth. Uh, basically just culminating in, in the idea that the process theology of the Roman Church really is the same thing as the Masonic theology they were fighting. <laughs> so uh, the Knights of Columbus uh, now tend to uh, team up with and work with Freemasonry and uh, hold joint gatherings and doing whatever. And, uh, you know, why would that be problematic when ultimately the the theology that you have about the supreme being, the monad, is the same. In its starting point, the same. All right. So obviously I'm not saying that Catholics in their practice believe that uh, masonry is true or that Jesus is just a man or anything like that. What I'm saying is that if you, on the one hand, confess those things, you can't turn around as a Catholic and confess a bunch of other things that are contradictory to it. Is double think, double mind, double speak. So, you know, you either have to get rid of the double mind or you have to keep playing this mental game of gymnastics where you, uh, you think that somehow these nonsensical things can be meshed together uh, just by saying, well, I just believe it on faith. Well, you know, that only works for so long. So it worked in the West for uh, about a millennium and then you have Vatican II. So Vatican II, again, is just a confirmation of a long process of uh, the degeneration of a tradition. And so what's the end result? Clown masses and a pope who officiated at the clown mass when he was Archbishop, uh, Archbishop Bergoglio. So there you go. That's, the, uh, that's my initial breakdown of Vatican II and what it meant. That's why you have these declarations of religious liberty, uh, declarations on relationships with uh, Islam, uh, where it's, it's a pretty openly Masonic view that you know the, the, the worshiping the same God, so therefore you know any any ecumenical services together now become possible, and it's just a radical departure from uh, you know the previous two millennia. So the Eastern view, uh, unfortunately, there are many in the East as well who think that the, uh, you know, the patriarch of Constantinople presently, uh, because he shares in all the same ecumenical activities as the papacy, uh, 
seems to be skullduggery at work there and deception and subterfuge. Uh, so possibly Bartholomew is compromised. And so you know, there's nothing, nothing in Eastern theology that says that's not possible. So, so that's really where we are in the, the history of Western civilization. We're, we're at an apex point of, of decay, I think, where things are really, the decay, the, the entropy, the disintegration is really beginning to set in. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, but uh, for those who listen that are Roman Catholic, uh, you know, I think it's time to consider other options. If you're not Roman Catholic and you're listening to this, hopefully it was uh, insightful. Maybe you'll get some notes and some ideas about uh, what, what's been going on in the history of Roman Catholicism in the last several hundred years. Um, it's a good starting point. And I think the unique aspect of my analysis is that it's able to tie in uh, a good understanding of the theology, the dogma, the history, the ecclesial scandals, and the intelligence and espionage and esoteric aspects of it. So, if you liked what you heard, tell your friends, subscribe to jaysanalysis.com, and you'll get more lectures like this. Thank you.